It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. This is the show, as many of you know, that's about all the great stuff going on at the University of Louisville, where we talk to researchers, doctors, students, and faculty members about all the cool stuff going on at U of L. So on the show today, you've heard of the Elizabeth Smart case, that 14-year-old girl who was held captive and raped for nine months back in 2002, right? Well, the former federal prosecutor from Utah who handled that case was in Louisville to talk about criminal justice and sentencing reform, and we'll be talking to him. We'll also have some excerpts from the speech U of L President Neely Bendapudi gave at her official inauguration a week and a half ago. She talked about U of L turning the page and operating under a new set of principles, spelling out the word cardinal. So we'll hear from her. But first, a new study found that thousands of women diagnosed with breast cancer might not need chemotherapy. Dr. Beth Riley is the deputy director of the James Graham Brown Cancer Center at U of L and is here to talk about this study and hopefully clear up some misconceptions and some confusion about this study. Beth, good to see you. Good morning. All right. Well, let's talk about this study that came out, this research that came out that said a lot of women that maybe have breast cancer, don't need to get chemotherapy. What was the study? What did it say? The name of the study was Taylor X, and it was a landmark study of over 10,000 women uh, utilizing technology called Oncotype DX, which is a test of 21 genes of the tumor. So not genes that you pass on to your family members, but genes of the actual tumor that can predict the rate of recurrence of that particular cancer. And so the study uh, looked at a certain category of results called an intermediate score and tried to determine whether or not patients in this category would benefit from chemotherapy. Okay. We already knew what women in, with a high score needed chemotherapy. We already knew that women with a low score did not, but the intermediate was uh, more difficult. And how many women are we talking about here? In- they tested over 10,000 women, so it's okay. strong evidence. Um, and can really guide clinical practice. And I think a woman who fits the criteria of this study, uh, which includes uh, a woman who is over 50, who has an estrogen receptor positive tumor, an estrogen driven tumor that is lymph node negative, uh, can s- undergo this testing. And those women, if they come back with a score of less than 25, which would be an intermediate or low score, they can feel confident they can safely avoid chemotherapy and not impact the outcome of the breast cancer. How many women in the United States or in Louisville or Kentucky, whatever figure you have, get breast cancer each year? So it's close to 200,000 women. Um, 40,000 40, women continue to die of breast cancer every year. Um, October is, as you know, Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month, and we've made a lot of strides in breast cancer, but we still lose about 40,000 women annually. So I guess the question is, out of those uh, 40,000 women that die, each year in the United States, how many of them fit in that intermediate category and may not have needed uh, chemotherapy or the 200,000 to get it? How many, what percentage are we talking about that fall in that intermediate score category and may not need chemotherapy? So the exact number is hard, especially when talking about the the death from breast cancer, but in terms of the overall numbers of women who get breast cancer, the estrogen positive breast cancer is the most common type. Uh, So this will affect the majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer. But only if they're over 50, right? And all the other only caveats. Only if they're over in 50, exactly. In the study, when they looked at women under 50, there continued to be benefit from chemotherapy. And that probably has to do with um, whether or not a woman is premenopausal or postmenopausal. It really has nothing to do with the magic number of 50. Uh, but women who are still ovulating, still menstruating, who get breast cancer, they have a slightly different sort of behavior of the tumor. And those women, at least based on this preliminary evidence, likely still need chemotherapy. We're talking with Dr. Beth Riley, who's the deputy director of the James James Graham Brown Cancer Center at the University of Louisville. And we're talking about this study that came out that said a number of women who have breast cancer perhaps don't need chemotherapy. So what is the, if you're in this intermediate, if a woman's in this intermediate category, this intermediate score, what are the alternatives then to chemotherapy? What is the treatment that they should be getting? Right. And these studies, this study was... um, demonstrated the women didn't need chemotherapy only if they took what's called endocrine therapy, so an anti-estrogen. So these women, their tumor is driven by estrogen. The tumor uses estrogen to grow, for lack of a better of analogy. And so part of the treatment uh, includes giving them an anti-estrogen. So manipulating the growth um, driver of the tumor is powerful enough that women don't need chemotherapy. These women still receive surgery. Oftentimes they received radiation, uh, but all of these women received endocrine therapy. And in the past, 
what kind of treatment you receive for cancer is based on where you are on the stages of cancer, stage two, three, four, right? So is this a total change of the way you're looking at breast cancer? Over the last sort of 10 years, we've seen a signal that stage is less important than what we call biology. And so this is a study that sort of underscores that. Regardless of um, your stage, the biology is probably a more important driver. There's Right now, we don't routinely use Oncotype DX in women with lymph node positive disease. Uh, there are certain circumstances in which we can use that test, and there are some studies that validate the use of that test in that way, but not in the robust way that TaylorX has done. There, there are studies ongoing to test women with um, low numbers of lymph nodes, one to three lymph nodes, with the use of this technology to see if chemotherapy can safely be avoided in those women also. Has this study changed the way uh, the doctors at James Graham Brown Cancer Center, perhaps other cancer centers across the United States, have begun looking at the breast cancer of women over 50? I believe it will, especially nationwide. We were already doing this a little bit at UofL. We were part of the TaylorX study, um, and most of us practice in a way that we believed that biology was more important than stage. Um, however, this just provides more, much more sound evidence rather than I think this is true. Now we can say I know this is true. Again, chatting with Dr. Beth Riley from the James Graham Brown Cancer Center at UofL. And what are you telling women now that are under 50? Clearly, this this doesn't uh, impact them, they still need chemo, right? Right. They most likely need chemotherapy. You can still get an Oncotype DX if you're under the age of 50, because if you come back with a recurrent score in the low category, you still can safely avoid chemotherapy. Uh, but it's now the intermediate and high risk. Uh, those women still require chemotherapy. All right. And the women over 50, um, you, you do this test basically uh, now. So what are you telling them when they walk in the door and they're 53 years old, they got breast cancer, what's the discussion you have with them now? If they're stage uh, one lymph node negative, estrogen positive, um, I do oftentimes offer an Oncotype DX, but in light of Taylor X, I can oftentimes predict what the Oncotype score will be. And so actually my use of this test has gone down because I know that a woman would have to get a score of 25 to uh, require chemotherapy, um, but it's part of standard of care. Everyone, every woman diagnosed with stage one breast cancer should ask the question, should they have this test, uh, especially if they are estrogen positive and lymph node negative. I guess that was my next question. What should women and their families be asking the doctors when they walk in um, these days and they have, they suspect they have breast cancer or they, they are breast cancer positive? I would say they would ask if they would qualify for Oncotype DX testing, and if so, if their score comes back intermediate or low, if the doctor feels that they would fit into that criteria of women who do not require chemotherapy. All right, and lastly, what else is on the horizon for breast cancer patients? Is there anything else that uh, is uh, hitting the medical journals these days that has changed the way, perhaps, that you're treating these folks? Most of the research um, is right now in the metastatic setting, looking for novel drugs, looking for immune, how to use immune therapy adequately, really trying to tackle that 40,000 women who die every year of breast cancer. Um, this particular study was in early stage disease and will greatly impact quality of life uh, for women, but most of those women, regardless of the choice of chemotherapy, are likely cured. So most of what we're focusing on now and should be talked about, especially during October, are those 40,000 living and dying of metastatic disease and what we can do to move the needle for them right now. And it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, as you mentioned earlier. All right. That's right. All right, Dr. Beth Riley, appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Well, there's been a lot of talk lately and over the past several years among lawyers, judges, legislators, public officials, prison officials, about overhauling the nation's criminal justice system, and in particular, the types of crimes that are resulting in long prison sentences, when maybe they shouldn't. Brett Tolman is a former U U.S. attorney from Utah who's in Louisville for a forum on criminal justice reform that's being held at the University of Louisville's Brandeis School of Law, and he has some definite opinions on... Uh, on uh, criminal justice reform and sentencing reform. Well, first of all, welcome to Louisville. Thank you. Good Glad to be with here. you. All right. So you were the uh, prosecutor on the Elizabeth Smart case, right? I was. I took that case from the state system, brought it into the federal system, and we ended up getting, you know, uh, virtually a life sentence on Brian David Mitchell for mm -hmm. the kidnapping and rape of Elizabeth Smart. So that's your claim to fame, huh? Well, you know, I, <clears throat> I'm i not sure it was something you ever want to be known for, but I was happy to bring justice to Elizabeth. I mean, she's a terrific young woman and uh, uh, you know, it was a case that kind of captured our state and the country as a whole, but it was one of those ones where we saw some of the weaknesses in the criminal justice system as well. Okay. Well, you're in Louisville, and uh, you're talking at this criminal justice uh, reform forum at the Brandeis School of Law. 
What are what are your views on this? From a former federal prosecutor, I think most folks would think, hey, you know what? The guy's probably, you know, throw away the key. Lock him up, throw away the key. Right. But that's not you, is it? Well, you know, it used to be me uh, <laughs> when I was younger, in my 30s. You don't um, look that old now. <laughs> thanks. I have a grandbaby, and I'm proud of her. Um, but I'm... You know, I was there in the, the same same place most people are when you think about criminal justice system, that we want to be tough on crime, you know, put bad guys behind bars. That's what I wanted to do. What you start to learn in the federal system is for every one, you know, Al Capone, there's a thousand out there that are low level, street level or, or lower, drug users, uh, minor dealers, uh, individuals that are just sitting in, in warehousing in our criminal justice system at thirty to forty thousand dollars per year, and I started to ask myself, is there a better way? I put my fair share of, of people behind bars. I have I have folks that are serving thirty, forty lifetime sentences. Mm-hmm. I'm very proud of the work I did, but there were some times when the federal punishment didn't match the crime, and we as citizens pay for that if we don't realize that ninety five percent of all people are going to get out of prison. So what are we doing to help them? So what is, what is the problem with the federal system? Each state is handling their own, in their own ways, criminal right. justice reform and sentencing reform, including Kentucky. Um, but what's the problem with the federal system? Is it the fact that there's no parole? Is it the fact that uh, for some drug crimes, the sentences are just too long? What is it? Yeah, it's, it, <clears throat> it's a combination of things. In the federal system, there's no parole, obviously. That's, a, that's an issue. So you're going to serve all of that sentence. But what we had was a decades and decades of be tough on crime legislation that started to increase those sentences, even for the low-level offenders. And, and so now you have sentences that are 20, 30, 40. We had an individual in Utah that was prosecuted. His name's Weldon Angelos. He served 55 years. He was sentenced to 55 years for selling a dime bag of marijuana. Was it his third offense or fourth offense? No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't even that. It was the fact that he was selling it in a bad neighborhood. He had a gun in his vehicle. And so he got 55 years of the way they, because of the way they stack that. Now, no question he should go to jail. And he served, uh, you know, a dozen, over a dozen years in federal prison and, until folks said, hey, something's not right with this. Mm-hmm. Um, we can still punish, be tough on crime. We can be smart, though, with our resources. Talking to Brett Tolman, who's a former U.S. attorney from the state of Utah, who's in Louisville for a uh, seminar uh, being held at the University of Louisville's Brandeis School of Law, talking about criminal sentencing reform and criminal justice reform. In Kentucky, um, there is a real push now, and there has been, to give... Uh, prisoners that are on their deathbeds, uh, terminally ill, um, have medical issues, early parole. Uh, is that something that the federal government should consider? Well, it, it's it's interesting you raise that because right now the First Step Act has pa- been passed in the House and is waiting to be passed in, in the, the Senate. Senate. But that's not what the Senate bill looks like, though. It's <clears throat> included. It, it, it has compassionate release reforms okay. that are in there. And when I say compassionate release, what we're looking at is individuals who may have, you know, a terminal illness. Uh, just last week, though, uh, it's interesting because even though it's not yet uh, in law, I, I think there's flexibility there. I have a client who just uh, got cancer. I was informed that the Bureau was going to try to do everything they can. The Bureau of Prisons was going to try to do everything they can to get him out early because he was terminal. Now, it tells me there's the attitude and the will to do that. We just need to now match the laws with, with what we see as important reforms. But these are always political solutions, and no politician wants to come up for re-election and be accused of being soft on crime. And that's the problem, isn't it? That it's the historical problem. What's interesting is how it's polling right now. Even among really red conservative states. Like Utah. Like Utah. And Kentucky. I mean, Clinton came in third in yeah. Utah. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, even in those states, it's polling very high that we want rehabilitation, we want work and education, we want them coming out better and not just coming out better criminals. And so let's be tough on crime, but let's be smart as well. And let's put those that need to be behind bars a long time behind bars. But let's, let's not have a one-size-fits-all. And, and, and that's what's surprising is the country is moving on that. Is it a financial equation now for a lot of taxpayers in the United States that we're spending, what, $250 billion or something along those lines per year on keeping prisoners it locked is. up? It, it absolutely is. You take Texas, for, exa- for example. They've closed four prisons, saved over $3 billion. How have they done it? Just by getting smarter. Nobody's accusing them of being weak on crime. 
But at some point, we all have to say hey, enough is enough. We're incarcerating at a rate beyond we've ever done, um, more than any other you know country in the world right now. And it's affecting more and more families. I think they're starting to, to experience that. And then we say to ourselves, is this how we effectively want to spend so many dollars, tax dollars? Are you a defense attorney now? I am a defense attorney, yeah. Prosecuted for you know over a decade as a federal prosecutor, and now almost a decade as a, as a defense attorney. So, so when did the light bulb go on? Was it just when you went to be a defense attorney and said, oh, geez, these guys are getting screwed by uh, – uh, the sentences they're getting in the federal system, or, you know, now the, what was it? The, the light bulb, it really was a couple of cases. I had a case, an uh, individual named Marco Antonio Rivas that I prosecuted. He's a kid, you know, 22 years old. I've, I've got a 22-year-old. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a bad weekend. Uh, he made some bad decisions. How bad? He, uh, he stuck up a couple that came in town from New York. Believe it or not, they had to go to Utah to get, you know, um, a, a gun pulled on them. And then he ran from the law, and uh, he carjacked a car. And no question, he needs to go to prison, and he, he's served a lot of time already. But he pled guilty to 30 years in federal prison. He'll be 50-some-odd years old when he gets out. It started me just to think about, you know, this individual I know has the ability to come out into society and no longer be criminal. Um, so it was then as a prosecutor that I saw that he was willing to plead to 30 years that I started to look at the just the sheer power of the prosecutor and the system in general. Talking again with Brett Tillman, who's a former U.S. attorney from the state of Utah, who's in Louisville for a seminar at uh, U of L School of Law. What do you tell students that are coming out of uh, universities and they want to go into criminal law one, on one side or the other? What do you tell them about the way the system works right now? Well, I argue a lot with colleagues of mine, and uh, irrespectfully, you know, respectfully, obviously, but um, I think the system is broken. We haven't focused on the criminal justice system in decades in terms of are we really analyzing it. And there are three things you're supposed to be doing as a prosecutor. You're supposed to punish, yes, deter crime, but the third one we forget about, and that's rehabilitation. So I'd like to tell the young lawyers that are, that are studying and wanting to get into this field, recognize that there's more than just what the criminal justice system has been that our society requires it to be and we want to see that change because i'm all for being tough on crime put them away for many years as a punishment but if they're 95 percent of them are going to get out what are we doing so that when they get out they've lowered their risk of recidivism all right we know what you'd say the the young bloods that are just coming into the legal system and making it a career what would you say to the (laughs) old folks in Congress in Washington uh, that are looking at this issue? You're in states like Kentucky, Georgia, Utah, Ohio, Texas, can all make meaningful reform. It's, uh, it's about time that Congress gets off their butt and does something and does it in a way that uh, the states have taught us should be done. Because you can be tough on crime and not lose voters by being smart. And I think, I think uh, Kentucky has learned that. I think many states have learned that. And it's, you know, it's an honor to be, to be with them. But I would say to Congress that, you know, stop messing around and get this done. And lastly, what would you say to the victims of crime who would say, you know what, that guy held me, your, your client, he held me up, he carjacked my car, he deserves to go away for 30 years. Where there are victims in crime, there's no question that the punishment needs to fit the crime. And there are horrific crimes you know the kidnapping of elizabeth smart he's in prison for the rest of his life and i'm good with that i think he'd harm people when he got out but what we're talking about is individuals who didn't harm someone or they're low-level drug offenders that are serving sentences that are longer i have sentences in the federal system where individuals are serving longer than rape homicide uh burglary in the state system so we've got to do something just not fair. Not fair. Okay. All right. Good deal. Brett Tolman, enjoy your stay in Louisville. I think you will. Thank you. All thanks, right. Mark. Thanks for coming. Well, most of you know that the inauguration of our brand new president at UofL, Neely Bendapudi, took place a few days ago, and she gave a speech about that. And you also know that the University of Louisville has had its struggles over the past two years. We're turning the corner with Dr. Bendapudi, but we have had some struggles. And she talked about some of those struggles during her inaugural speech. And uh, so I'm going to play a little bit of about six, seven minutes of her speech that you may not have heard on TV or seen on the web that I think is important for those of you in the community and those of you who are alumni of the University of Louisville to hear. So this is part of Dr. Ben Deputy's inauguration speech uh, from the University of Louisville. 
Let me just take a few moments about how we will conduct ourselves. Over the past four months, I've listened to many, many faculty and staff and students, alumni, key constituencies, people you see on the stage here, and ask them what they want from the leadership of this university. They recognize that the University of Louisville is the economic engine for Louisville, and that Louisville is the economic engine for the Commonwealth, and economic engine for the state. And therefore, they're rooting for us to be great. They're rooting us for us to be moral. I'd like to share with you some principles that I have garnered during my time here. These are the cardinal principles, if you will. Sorry, I just could not resist. This is an acronym, but these are my words and they attempt my, um, they are my attempt to reflect back to you what I've heard from you. C, let us be a university that is a community of care. Care for self, care for one another as cardinals, and care for the community well beyond as part of the human family. We're a community, not just a collection of individuals. We're a community, we're not just buildings connected by an HVAC system, as a friend of mine says. A, accountability. Accountability to the team, to the community. We keep our promises. We own up to mistakes. We are accountable. R, respect, irrespective of position. We respect each other's humanity and dignity, no matter what our positions in the organization might be. We also respect our right to differing and conflicting positions on issues. A quote I read somewhere, and I'll paraphrase it, says, we will be a place that prepares students for ideas, not protects students from ideas. D, diversity and inclusion. We celebrate diversity of thought, of life experiences, of perspectives. Our state motto says it all. United, we stand. We want everybody in the richness of their many unique and intersecting identities to feel loved and included in the cardinal fold. I, integrity and transparency. We will be true to our mission of an urban research university. Integrity is our collective commitment to make decisions with the best interests of the university in mind and to share the decision-making rationale and the outcomes transparently. N, noble purpose. Each of us will identify for ourselves the ways in which we will make a difference. We know we must solve the problems of access and affordability to give everybody a chance to find and pursue their own noble purpose. A, agility. We will recognize that things change, but we recognize also that when they do, we can and must change things as well. We know that when the adaptation within an organization does not keep pace with the adaptation in the environment, the environment will win, the organization will not. L, leadership. We recognize that management is a, not a, is a position, but leadership is not just a position, it's an activity. We will all behave as owners of the University of Louisville because we are. Faculty, staff, and students, and alumni, we are UFL cannot just be a hashtag or a slogan. It is our declaration of leadership and ownership. There you have it, the cardinal principles. There will not be a quiz right now, but in the coming days and months and years, we will work together to examine how these principles shape the questions we tackle and the solutions we propose. These are the thoughts, the dreams, the inspiration that keeps me motivated. We will become a great place to learn, a great place to work, and a great place to invest because, and this is important, because we will be a place that celebrates diversity, fosters equity, and strives for inclusion. We know we won't get there overnight. And indeed, I also know we'll never get to a point where we say, oh, let's stop, we did it, we're great enough. 
The pursuit of excellence is its own reward. So let me conclude with this. Students, I challenge you to make the most of your time here to make this for you a great place to learn. Faculty and staff, I sincerely thank you for all you've done and challenge you to co-create and maintain a culture that makes this a great place to work. And all of you who are here, I implore you and challenge you to step up and invest in us. We need you today. There's no question in my mind that at the University of Louisville, our best days, our greatest days are ahead of us. Thank you for the opportunity of a lifetime. And as I wrap up now, by now you know the rules, I will count up to three, and on the count of three, be prepared to throw your L's and to yell, go cards. Are you ready? On one, two, three, go cards! Thank you so very much, I'm honored. That was UofL President Neely Bendapudi on her inauguration day, giving a little uh, speech and talking about some of the issues facing the University of Louisville and some new principles that University of Louisville faculty, staff, and students will be asked to abide by in the future. That'll about do it for this edition of UofL Today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. You can always check out the podcast on SoundCloud or check out some of these shows which are on TV, on Metro TV or on KETKY throughout the week. You can catch all the UofL news, events, and what's going on on campus at uoflnews.com. Thanks for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert and Go Cards! <laughs>